fresh off of a successful premium live event, Backlash 2024 emanating from Lyon, France, proved to be one of the best PLEs in recent memory. Not only did it have fantastic matches and continuation of storylines across both brands, but it introduced us to a group of fans, a collective crowd like those in the France audience who brought the energy, who brought the excitement throughout every single match that had taken place at the event. I personally, as a fan of professional wrestling for nearly 25 years, have never seen anything like this. To see the amount of dedication, the excitement, the the loudness that they brought within each segment was tremendous. Not only did it elevate the event itself, but I feel like it it elevated France as a pro wrestling audience to another level. I think not only in myself, but I feel like other people, other fans across the globe, namely those in the higher ups of the WWE, can expect France to have more PLEs, more events come their way just because of this weekend on Friday Night SmackDown and the Backlash event that presented us with such an electric atmosphere for every single segment that had taken place. In today's video, I just wanted to give a brief update, a brief review as to how my feelings were, my thoughts and feelings regarding the Backlash event going through each segment. And obviously, the first matchup that was being presented at Backlash was the tag team of the Bloodlines, Solo Sokoa and Tama Tonga versus Randy Orton and Kevin Owens, a matchup that really had gotten thrown together within the last couple of weeks. But on, on the grand scheme of things, Randy Orton and Kevin Owens have been feuding with the Bloodline for quite some time. Kevin Owens, for years, Randy Orton was placed on the shelf by the Bloodline a couple of years back. And in this match, we expected a lot of interference. We expected a lot of carnage to have taken place between these two teams that have a, a vendetta against one another. Certainly a blood feud in the making. However, that's how it all started out. And Nick Aldis comes out into the arena... And he announces that we are making this a street fight. The crowd erupts. And that was one of the first instances that we had seen that this France crowd was different. And obviously with the inclusion of a street fight stipulation, therein lies the opportunity to have a Jacob fought to interfere. So we get the breakdown. We have all this tons of action and namely a lot of table spots, which never are a, you know, a, a bad thing. We love seeing tables getting broken. And one thing I did notice was there was a lot of headshots by like the the um, the garbage cans, by the the can lids. Very interesting to see how that has come about back into the WWE. I know CTE and concussions are very much a real concern when it comes to sports, but to see that back in wrestling, very eye widening. It's something I caught on very early on. I'm assuming. Maybe these cans are gimmicked in some way, or perhaps they're not hitting each other with as much force. But hearing the noise and, and the velocity in which they're swinging these cans at one another, I just thought that was very important to, to point out. But of course, as I mentioned, a lot of great spots. The crowd was fantastic. It was electric throughout each match, as you will notice, as I mentioned in, in each match review. But ultimately, Kevin Owens hits a brain buster off of the top rope. He goes for the pin and is unable to secure the victory. Why? Because, of course, interference from the bloodline. However, it was not Jacob Fatu, which was a very popular prediction among internet fans. Instead, no, Tama Tonga's brother, Tangaloa. Very interesting development. I personally did not see this coming through. I personally thought it was going to be Jacob Fatu. So to see them have Tamatanga and Tangaloa come back together, the Gorillas of Destiny, as they were known in New Japan Pro Wrestling, adds another layer to this Bloodline story. You see at the end of the match, of course, the Bloodline would win, which we, which we correctly predicted on this channel. You would see Solo Sokoa in the middle, flanked by his new members of his Bloodline, the Gorillas of Destiny, and Paul Heyman reluctantly putting up the acknowledgement, the one. I want to see where they go with this, obviously because we know Jacob Fatu is arriving. He's just around the corner. But to see the development of the Gorillas of Destiny and also Solo Sokoa basically assuming the role of the leader. And on top of that, you go back to this previous episode of Friday Night SmackDown and Paul Heyman announces, brings out the revelation that he hasn't spoken with Roman Reigns since his WrestleMania defeat. In fact, he was the one 
that withdrew Roman Reigns from the WWE draft this year. Where do we go from here? How do we continue furthering the storyline? And at what point do we see Roman Reigns return? What about The Rock? Jimmy Uso has to return at some point as well. And then, of course, later in the night, we saw that interaction between this new bloodline and Jay Uso. Planting seeds for a possible feud between those two factions. I think the obvious route would be the Gorillas of Destiny versus the Usos, which is a dream matchup in itself. But to see how we get there, that's the intriguing part. And of course, we kept the momentum rolling as the triple threat match between WWE Women's Champion Bayley, Tiffany Stratton, and Naomi would be the next matchup. And the entrances alone proved once again why this France crowd was electric all night. You saw the ovation that they gave Naomi, the response that they gave Tiffany Stratton, as well as Bailey as they sung her song to her, that classic, Hey Bailey, Would You Be My Girl song to her as they would sing in NXT. But the match itself was a fun, entertaining triple threat match that would see Bailey retain her ma- her championship rather um, against Naomi. Tiffany Stratton, did not receive the pin, which could be expected because you want to be able to protect the next up-and-coming star. Naomi does not get any damage from taking that pin. I don't think it hurts her reputation. I don't think it hurts her momentum. Certainly the way that they've done it as well. There was a quick exchange where Naomi would land a pinfall and then Bailey would reverse it and counter it for a pinfall of her own, ultimately sealing the victory. I think moving forward, this is the right decision to go with. Tiffany Strand, as I said, protected Keeping her momentum, would, did not take the pinfall, did not take the loss. Bailey retains the title, continuing to build upon this title reign, and hopefully a lengthy title reign at that because she hasn't really held singles gold in quite some time. And speaking of crowd reactions, you look at the reaction that Jay Uso received from this audience in France. It looked like it was straight out of a concert. He came through the audience Coming out to his theme music, you saw everyone doing the yeet dance. And on top of that, they used their cell phones and lit up the night sky, lit up the dark arena filled with their flashlights as they would continue to do the yeet dance. And the energy, again, was there. This matchup was red hot. Damian Priest defending his World Heavyweight Championship against Jey Uso. And the story of the matchup was that Damian Priest wanted to avoid any type of involvement or help from his fellow Judgment Day members. And although J.D. McDonough, who was still sporting a bruised forehead from that punch that he received by Logan Paul on Monday Night Raw, as well as Finn Balor, he wanted to get rid of that interference. He wanted to prove that he himself could defeat Jey Uso and didn't need anybody's help. Ultimately, due to that interference, he did retain the title. And after the matchup, Damian Priest prevented Finn Balor and J.D. McDonough from continuing to beat down Jey Uso. He said, that's enough. There's no need for this. Damian Priest has established himself as the leader of the Judgment Day. Now that Rhea Ripley isn't around because she's having to nurse her injury, it's clear that the main leader is Damian Priest. So to see him throw around his team members, J.D. and Finn, again, trying to calm them down and reassume that lead position, for a split second, I thought we were going to see a babyface turn where Damian Priest would break away from the group. But no, ultimately, it's just a power play. He wants to be able to sustain that leadership, that responsibility to hold everyone accountable, hold them in line. So where do we go from here? Jay Uso, as I mentioned, already had a small interaction with the Bloodline after their match and before his. So we know somewhere down the line, a Jay Uso will reenact maybe last year's uh, civil war between the bloodline, but introducing new players. And as for Damian Priest, who will be his next challenger? I don't see this matchup moving forward. If it does, it'll be for the sole purpose because Jey Uso wants a fair shot. And perhaps Damian Priest will give it to him because he wants to be able to prove that he is not a transitional champion and that he is a legit threat to every single member of the WWE Raw roster. I think it was a fun match, again, continuing on the momentum, and the crowd only elevated it, as I mentioned. But leading into the fourth matchup, we have the WWE Tag Team Championships, the Kabuki Warriors, Asuka and Kairi Sane defending their titles against Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair. And again, high energy, a fun matchup. And when I tell you, 
I loved the finish to see the power displayed by Jade Cargill, where she's able to lift up Kyrie Sane in a power bomb position, toss her into the air, kind of maneuver her and flip her to where she's now in an electric chair position, then throw her back over her head, catch her, and be able to hit her finish on Kairi Sane, very reminiscent to how she did it to Sky Blue in AEW a couple years back. When I tell you I popped for this finish, it was fantastic. And on top of that, you, you finish that off with Bianca Belair hitting a Dominator-like finish on Asuka on top of Kairi for the pinfall. One, two, three, new WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. And so far on the PLE night, we're four for four. Have not missed. We predicted every single match so far and heading into that main event. The main event really felt like a main event because of the presentation, the camera work, the the commentators, and the fans. The way AJ Styles comes out to just respect and adulation from the audience. They continue to do this chant that translated into celebrating the word phenomenal, which I thought was just infectious. It became so, so catchy. I don't know the exact translation, but the jingle itself was just so catchy. I loved it. I loved it. And then you see Cody Rhodes come out to probably his best entrance since his WWE return. Having the audience sing word for word his theme song, Kingdom. And on top of that, once his theme song ceased to play over the the speakers, the audience continued to finish out the rest of the verse. I'm telling you, Cody Rhodes was probably on cloud nine, listening to that ovation that he received from France, from that audience. And then on top of that, Samantha Irving, as she introduced the combatants, of course, AJ Styles, the challenger, Cody Rhodes, the champion, and the audience hang on for every single word with her. Tremendous stuff. Fantastic. In that moment alone, France earns another show pretty soon. And I know Nick Khan and and Triple H kind of hinted at perhaps a stadium show. That's yet to be seen, but I would love it. Absolutely. But the match itself, speaking of loving it, what a great matchup. A half an hour worth of content. AJ Styles, Cody Rhodes, proving once again why these are two of the top stars, not only within the WWE, but in pro wrestling in general. AJ Styles demonstrating why he's the phenomenal one. And although many like to point fun at his age, being that he's in his mid-40s, this guy can still go. Busting out 450s, springboard 450s, the strength, the finesse, the athleticism, the psychology. I thought he was the perfect choice for Cody Rhodes to have his first title defense against. You want to legitimize the championship. You want to legitimize a champion. You have him go up against one of the very best. And AJ Styles has been that guy. He did it for Roman Reigns back in 2016. He did it for Seth Rollins a number of years ago. AJ Styles and Cody Rhodes made magic. And Cody looked like he belonged. He demonstrated why he is the guy. Why he's the quarterback, as he would like to put it. And to see the story and the athleticism that they displayed in this matchup. One thing I really liked about this matchup is the psychology. You saw AJ Styles targeting that shoulder of Cody Rhodes because as we all know, he managed to, I don't want to say feign an injury. I hope it's not a legitimate injury, but you see his matchup against Carmelo Hayes two SmackDowns ago where Carmelo Hayes kind of went for a springboard crossbody. And on the other end, I think Cody Rhodes was intending to do some kind of super Cody cutter where he would meet him in midair and catch him and it didn't connect and he fell on his shoulder and he kind of sold it as always if he hurt himself but in this matchup AJ Styles goes after that shoulder he addresses that injury again whether it's a shoot or if it's kayfabe the fact is they incorporated it into the matchup ultimately Cody Rhodes would emerge victorious having a successful title reign title defense, excuse me, under his belt. And the crowd, they're sent home happy. Cody Rhodes, the American Nightmare, retains the WWE Championship. 
along with Damian Priest and Bailey, who retain their titles respectively. But Damage Control loses the last bit of championships that I, that they had left in their faction because Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair, now your new WWE Tag Team Champions. For me personally, it was an all-time event. This audience is up there, quite frankly, and I think it solidifies. I love when wrestling comes to Toronto and Montreal. I love the Canadian fans. I love Chicago fans, the Philly fans, but this solidifies it. European crowds, whether it's London, whether it's in Wales, whether it's in France. The fans in Europe, they bring it every time. And I look forward to the next time they arrive. Obviously, they're going to be in Montreal. Or excuse me, they're going to be in Toronto for Money in the Bank. And then Bash at Berlin. Very much looking forward to it. I hope you guys enjoyed the event as much as I did. Please comment down below which match was your favorite, which chant was your favorite by the French crowd. And with that being said, my name is Jose Ramos Jr. I will see you guys in the next video. Until then.